So um, Daniel um, Niles um, is here today. He came um, to participate in the workshop, but I wanted to take this opportunity um, <clears throat> so that Na um, Daniel can introduce some of his ideas um, to um, archaeologists, anthropologists, and beyond on the campus. Um, Daniel works for the Research Institute for Humanity and Nature um, as associate professor. His background is geography, but I have to say I learned so much from him about how we conceptualize human environmental interactions beyond ecological model. I think when I first met him in 2010, my brain was still functioning in a way that, okay, how can I use formal models to interpret hunter-gatherer activities, subsistence, and settlement? And he was really the one who started to make me think, okay, how can I link what I'm doing to contemporary environmental issues and I think um, with the help from other faculty members here, Meg, Christine, Lisa, uh, who else is here? Bill is on the back. We've been having really good discussions on how to uh, think about uh, incorporating our experiences from the past to think about contemporary issues and um, to the future. And um, today's um, title um, of his presentation is Overlapping Forms. Thinking material culture and environmental knowledge. Okay. Please welcome Daniel. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, hi. Uh, okay, thanks so much, Junko. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, thank you for the for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, I'm really pleased to be able to be here. Um, I learned also so much in Junko's project that. Um, I'm, I'm kind of shocked to hear that what she learned from me too because I felt like I was getting such an education from uh, this, this the, the environmental history, the landscape histories, and the, 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 the history of, of Japan, which I really didn't know very well before uh, Juko came up. And I got really, I think, just a crash course in a, in a bunch of really fascinating stuff that has just opened up my, my, my own thinking in a way which I probably never would have been possible otherwise. So. It's really been an amazing uh, experience. And there's a second uh, thing, which is that I now live and work in Japan, and that was never my plan. I, I just didn't have that in mind uh, at all. And um, I think, too, uh, I used to do, uh, I spent about three years in Mexico and Central America, and I kind of always assumed that I would be between California and there, because I'm originally from Berkeley. This was kind of in my part of the world, more or less. And uh, I never really thought that much about Japan, but getting there and having now spent this time and kind of slowly importing my ideas from other places uh, and from other kind of parts of my uh, other, other interests um, into the Japanese context, it's somehow I feel like I have been able to learn things there or to find things there that I think would have been really difficult to find in most other places, that you can see certain kinds of relationships, in particular the cultural and ecological relationships with a kind of clarity in a way and a historical depth once you begin to get that uh, lens um, that um, it's just really fascinating. Uh, and it's part of the reason why Japanese, uh, Japan is such a, is such a it's a, if, why Westerners fall so head and over heels in love with Japan, which I'm now kind of very skeptical about in some ways, but anyway, uh, <laughs> that you confront there in Japan, you know, the idea that there's, there's, a, there's a modernity, the modernity that we kind of take for granted here takes a very different form there. And you have to confront the, the, the culture. You have to confront culture in a way in which many times I think scientists here are oftentimes kind of, it's easy to kind of make culture an extra dynamic somehow, magic ingredient. And, uh, and when you get the same people into Japan, immediately you have to confront the fact that, you know, culture is just everything. You know. So that's the basic <laughs> summary of my paper. No, in, uh, uh, not really. Um, so this paper has a couple different roots, but it's really based in um, a chance that I had for a few years to be a member of the scientific committee of this, or of this small program within the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, which was called um, the Globally Important Agricultural Heritage Systems Program, or GIAS for short. And GIAS was a very kind of noble idea uh, conceived by, by one man there, 
FAO is not famous for its support of small farmers, really. Uh, it's not famous for agroecological perspective, although it's now doing a little bit more in that realm. It's really been one of the big supporters of kind of big ag distributions uh, and, and facilitations. And um, nevertheless, within the FAO, this idea of the GIAS, this globally important agricultural heritage, was an idea that we should have some designation kind of akin to the UNESCO World Heritage, um, World Cultural Heritage designation for agricultural knowledge systems, for agricultural systems. And they decided that they would create this little marker and that they would, you know, go find places in which they thought that there were really high quality traditional agricultural systems. So you're talking about, you know, agrobiodiversity and food culture and livelihood, uh, uh, persistence through time, landscape, landscape services, depending on how you want to uh, talk about it. All of these things which really couldn't be distinguished, really couldn't be uh, separated. Uh, one from the other. So you had to talk about kind of a cultural ecological whole there. And the, and the problem with that was that we wanted, those of us who were on the committee and the FAO, we wanted to provide some kind of guidelines about what, once these places were designated, what to do then? How do you, what, 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 what should a government, local government or state government or national government or the FAO in itself do in order to support these places? And we kicked that discussion around. It's not the most efficient institution, the FAO. Um, but we kind of kicked that idea or the discussion around for a couple of years before it just hit me after having been to a bunch of these different sites that we were never going to answer that question until we had a really good idea of why these places were persisting through time first. Until we had an idea of what makes for cultural ecological persistence we were never going to be able to design adequate, a policy which would really support places in their entirety, as opposed to the kind of uh, green logoing that, that we were oftentimes kind of default, uh, uh, proposing by default or supporting by default. And so that was, the, uh, that was the beginning for me of a totally different perspective and it happened to coincide uh, largely with the time in which uh, Junko was at uh, Santa Cruz or sorry, was at uh, 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 Kyoto. Now, I also had, in this time, come across um, a woman, uh, Inuyupak woman um, artist, who gave this amazing presentation in which she basically asked, how am I to understand the relevance of my cultural knowledge to the world today? of all my people's experience, like what is it, is it worth something today? Because apparently we're kind of like possibly the stewards of these small territories, but there was no kind of sense that all of that cultural experience, all of that knowledge would have some active role in, uh, uh, in the world today. It just seemed totally kind of incommensurate to the, to the, to the big problems of of climate change in the Arctic and all that. And she had this great phrase for kind of what she was trying to do in her work, which was to try to uh, link between the hyper future and the super ancient. And she then went on, uh, Allison, uh, to the Anchorage Art Museum where she made an installation, a two month installation in which she was present in the museum called the Place, uh, the Place, Place of the Future Ancient, uh, in which people would confront not only the artifacts of her peoples, but actually a real person, and have to uh, make all of these different uh, exercises, which she did. And I thought that she was really uh, kind of uh, uh, onto something and, um, and, and addressing it in a really creative way. And at the same time, um, we have these very pressing concerns, very immediate concerns, very kind of techno institutional scientific concerns about how to deal with things like climate change and nuclear waste and all this. And this is one of those signs which was, which was created as a result of this immense uh, social, uh, social uh, institutional process trying to figure out what to do about signaling zones, signaling knowledge through time. And uh, this is kind of the best we can get to. And, and after all of those panels, it was, a, it was a Proceedings of National Academy panel that eventually developed this kind of thing. So it was really supposed to be our best efforts in fact, there's a documentary film about this 
in which people say, you know, we've never had to do this type of communication to future generations before. <laughs> and I just thought, wow, that's weird. It seems like as if there's been, humankind have not been able to convey knowledge through time. And it seems to me that they have indeed. And that we can come up with things like this, which seem to, I mean, that, I almost don't understand what that means. It's a, it's a, it's a bit uh, strange. And then, all of you, I think, are familiar now, having uh, Junko here, uh, with this type of artifact. But I remember the first time that I saw this when I arrived in Japan, there was a, 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 an archaeological project there. And I saw an image of this pot, I believe. And I just couldn't make head or tails of this thing. I just thought it was about the weirdest thing that I'd ever seen, in a way. And yet, it, when you look at it, it's so laden with meaning. And I thought over time, you know, what is the meaning? What is the knowledge that we lack that this thing has no significance for us? On the one hand, there seems to be an awful lot of, of knowledge, an awful lot of value, we can say, invested in this pot and pots like it. And on the other hand, we have this break in which it seems none of that somehow is transferred to us. So I began to focus more on uh, material culture in general, as I thought, this, these things, we have got to be able to do a little bit better with these. Now, this is nothing new to you, I think, that you, you are the archaeologist. So I, this is my kind of naive you know, approach, in a way, to, to, to your field. But I hope that it won't be entirely naive as I go through. So if I kind of say, in, in, a, in a nutshell, where I have come to in this, uh, in this presentation and in this paper, which is now kind of out for review, and we'll see what happens, is that we have, in landscapes, lots of environmental knowledge embedded lots of uh, 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 particular cultural perceptions of uh, the agencies of nature, I can say, in the most general way, encoded in landscapes and also running through material and immaterial culture. And when we look at these objects, they have very material significances. They have metaphorical, allegorical, representational, and they also have very metaphysical significances. That is, they are just as material as they are immaterial, even though they are material. And this, to me, raises a question about how we understand the forms of knowledge out there in the world and the activities and patterns by which knowledge is conveyed through the generations. And finally, as I was just saying, of the significance of, this type of, of these types of knowledges to the present. And so today I want to talk about what I call the uh, charcoal forest, in which I say charcoal, uh, uh, try to discuss charcoal as an embodiment of particular understandings of the agencies of, of the natural world. And that when you look a little bit uh, closely at the production and the use of charcoal, you begin to see something about the structure of this knowledge. And especially on the areas, they seem very important to me, in which the qualities that are understood in one area of activity are transferred into another area of activity. And I'll try to explain what I mean by that. But I call those areas of transference in which knowledge kind of developed in one domain of life is transferred or made available for another domain as an overlap. And these overlaps are really important because they link within a landscape activities which are separate and yet part of a whole. Not only are they separate, but once you watch the workings of the knowledge which is being transferred, you see that actually neither of them could exist. Neither of these different areas of activity could exist without the other. So you have this kind of idea of mutual constitution. And this sheds some light on what I've just been talking about, this idea of how culture persists through time. So in Japan, and in many other places, the Gias zones, for example, they happen to be my, favorite, my kind of favorite because they are designated. They've kind of been recognized. And you seem to get some added value in terms of the significance of your research for local communities if you can say the local communities have got a designation, they've got international you know, recognition, and they can take that, we always thought, as a lever, essentially, to start to improve the kind of the conditions, the policy conditions their ability to discuss those things in public fora. So 
you see in Japan, but in other places, long-standing, diverse, complex cultural ecologies whose persistence has been poorly theorized, I think, in both human and ecological difference. Uh, um, and one of the key things that you see right away, and I think this is a huge problem for people in general when you start talking about ter uh, heritage and tradition, is that it's assumed to have been some, it's like, so there was some past in which there was a tradition and that's how it was at a moment. Instead of there being essentially kind of continuous presence in which the past is also uh, uh, of, uh, a present. So persistence, even if you talk about persistence of agricultural heritage zones over the course of a thousand years, because some of them even have uh, more uh, uh, um, uh, time than that, um, you're not talking about a stasis, a cultural ecological stasis, but instead you can see persistence as evidence, as proof of the successful transmission of knowledge through successive generations. So in that sense, what I think is when it comes to questions of sustainability, and here I kind of get to my end, we're trying to invent now sustainability out of the ruins, essentially, of our last you know, centuries of uh, techno-scientific organization of the world. Meanwhile, ignoring, in my view, the lessons of the people who actually have proven sustainabilities in landscapes through time. And part of the problem that we can't see that is because we can't, we can't the, part of the re problem we can't recognize the value of those sustainabilities is because we don't see the knowledge as knowledge. We see essentially relics, artifacts, et cetera. And this is because the knowledge of these places has not really often taken what we call formal form, but is instead embedded in practices, in artifacts, and in patterns. So, and if we change our perspective of, of, about that, then we can see that we have lots and lots of data, lots and lots of access to knowledge in the form of all the classic artifacts, pottery and tools and textiles, house form and seeds and foods and tastes even, as I will try to describe, and the related social practices the beliefs, the local institutions. We can see these all as methods of conveying knowledge from past to future, including even the surrounding landscape and biomes. So to make this case, I basically uh, draw upon three literatures, and each of these we could discuss kind of at length, and I, I think that would be really interesting, but probably we don't have enough time uh, to really do that. So, I'll kind of go through these uh, pretty quickly, and then I wanna show you a bunch of pictures of this place, and talk about some of the graphics so that you can see kind of what I mean in terms of the real landscapes. But basically, I found three literatures which I think are really interesting, each of them really rich um, and I think very uh, compelling uh, and provocative. The first one is the work, uh, is what we can call co-evolution or extended evolution, and that's really based upon, there's a lot of people have written on co-evolution through time, but Recently, there have been um, Jürgen Wren, who is the director of the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, and Manfred Laubichler, who is an uh, Arizona State, um, have written a couple of papers, three papers, proposing their approach, their idea of uh, extended evolution or coevolution, which I described briefly. I have a reference list at the end of this paper if you're interested. And then, um, uh, so that is, you know, they're developing, as I say, a structural but not deterministic description of, uh, of evolutionary change. And I think that they do, um, that, that, that that's pretty interesting. The second is um, anthropological literature on um, uh, the ontological and epistemological significance of culture, of cultural diversity. And on that, I really think of the literature that I'm aware um, Philippe Descola is really the, is the, is the, is one of the, the most interesting. And he's got a really wonderful short six paragraph piece in which he lays out what he means by this kind of pluralistic anthropology. And I read a little bit of that to you in a minute. And then there's material culture studies, which is an enormous field as you all know much better than I. And, and I've really kind of been around the edges except for the fact that I think there have been some very interesting developments in, in, in the last handful of years from people like Tim Ingold, uh, Pierre Lemonnier, and, um, and other French who are kind of drawing on a different uh, 
um, they're turning material studies away from the study of artifacts, decorative artifacts, and more into uh, objects in relationship to what they say are currents of social activity or systems of thought and action. So trying to draw objects into this kind of deep context as kind of, as kind of agents within that. So co-evolution. Co um, if we kind of summarize out of their papers, the papers of Wren and Laubichler, we can say kind of three major things. First, it's that they use, they, they talk about uh, uh, coevolution in, in relationship to various uh, um, entities, human and non-human. And it's very interesting to see the way that they do that. But in terms of human societies, um, they say, human societies transform their environments by means of their material culture. And in doing so, they create this niche that decisively shapes their evolution. Second, that human societies all have rules uh, about what it is that people can and can't do. And from their perspective, cultural information is stored in those rules as well as in the material culture that supports them. So I'll come back to that idea in a second. But third, that the niche, and this is very important, extends the system itself by providing critical regulatory effects. That is that the system that's being, the niche that's been created becomes essentially the locus for experience in which the evolution continues to unfold. So that people are changing the environment in ways that, that reflect their pref preferences based upon what's around them. And then those preferences get essentially kind of become more available or become built in and that becomes the next locus for uh, transformation. And while they're doing that, they're changing not just their environment but also their informational environment so that they have, as I said, this new locus of experience and a new potential source of change. So there's, there's what they call a, essentially a process of in externalization in which the activities of a people are become essentially contextual and internalization in which context is brought into the, the, the culture itself or the practices itself. So in terms of our understanding of niche, then we can say right away that niche is not something out there that's waiting to be inhabited, but it's something that has to be created and filled. And then there's the very interesting element, which is what we all know, that constructed niches persist longer than any of their individual inhabitants. And that's really interesting. It means that something is being preserved between people. So the storage and the transference of important hereditary and regulatory information. That is, niches contain signals that later inhabitants can read and act upon. And when we're talking about signals, in my view, we're really talking about knowledge. And knowledge, we can say, can operate as a particle and a wave. That is, knowledge we all know is sets of ideas that we can communicate, that we can share you know, through the air. But that also knowledge takes real material form. So Wren and Laubichler talk about knowledge, first of all, as encoded experience. So it's a very pragmatic, or we could say a practical approach to the idea of what is knowledge. And they talk about it in terms of institutions. They talk about it in terms of you know, uh, rituals. Uh, there are all these ways in which people create to deliberately make people do things that, they, that, that a place or a people thinks is important. But then they have this line in, their, uh, in this paper here, um, Ren does, in which they say knowledge is not just a mental structure. It also involves material and social dimensions that play a critical role in determining what actions are possible and legitimate. And they go on to talk about material artifacts such as instruments or text, but we can do just as much by talking about material artifacts in terms of objects and seeds and other things. And then when you're looking at the persistence of cultural ecological, you have to say kind of, well, what is, what are we talking about when we're talking about knowledge? And this is where I think that Philippe Descola is so interesting because he says very clearly, we must give, I mean, this sounds very, that's not the right words, we don't give, but we must acknowledge 
the ontological integrity of cultural experience that people develop through these communities of practice, as I would just show to you, uh, ways of determining what is and isn't in the world. So, Gascola says, human action in particular places is gradually stabilized through communities and practice in which specific schemes of action and thought emerge, which imbibe the life we lead in common with an observable coherence. We can see these operations as a sort of ontological sifting of the qualities of the world that impinges upon many aspects of human experience, such as the sorting of existing things into categories, the type of agency which, which with these existing things are credited, and the nature of the relations they maintain, the way in which collectives are constituted and interact with other collectives, the definition of what an agent and a patient is, of how a legitimate and effective action can be deployed, the conditions under which a proposition can be held to be true and knowledge to be authentic, etc. Okay, he's saying, you know, so, so clearly, and it seems to me eloquently that when you are talking about, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty in a way of, of um, believing in holes. You know, that there are, uh, there is, you know, there are kind of cultural collectives that are, that are different in different places and that you can find them and think about them as holes. So I kind of, you know, spilled the beans on that from the very beginning. But here he is saying that the knowledge which is developed within these places is integral mm -hmm. to those places. And that's really interesting, and I, I don't skip this, but there's been a very interesting reaction from Ingold and a few others, I think, on how when you look at the material cultural realm, people have really missed that ontological element or epistemological element of things, of knowledge. And they have instead focused on what are essentially uh, oftentimes descriptive or decorative elements without ever really getting at the significance of material. And without going in detail, this, his, this is from the, his book, The Perception of the Environment, and then he wrote another paper called um, Towards an Ecology of Materials, in which he says the same thing, more or less. And the book has many more examples. It's, it's, I find it very interesting and, um, and worth uh, attention. So uh, in, in Ingold and others, then you say, you, in material culture, you have not uh, simply practical decorative, but perception of internal qualities. And as I said before, this idea that objects represent knowledge systems. That is, as Descola is saying, represent reflections or uh, represent uh, ideas of what is out there, of how things can be known, of what relationship between this thing and other things are there that make it possible to exist. So here we return to that. Okay, this is my last wordy slide. Um, so the overlapping idea. Here I'm gonna introduce a little bit of carbon and forest, uh, uh, charcoal, forest, kiln, and use. And each of these, as I said, involves a set of knowledge which is distinct from the other and yet also defining within. So that charcoal becomes both contingent upon and constitutive of other practices, some material, some immaterial, some that directly have to do with charcoal and others which do not. And in this view, we see, I think, uh, that these overlapping forms allow charcoal to be created and recreated as an object of the past, dependent upon the knowledge of the previous generations, and yet always current <coughs> in the landscapes and the ecologies and in the human experience that it represents. So, okay, finally. Uh, this is the place, this is, um, these are the, this is a little a model of the coastal hills of uh, Wakayama uh, Prefecture in, in kind of central uh, western Japan. And um, it's, a, it's one of those Gia sites that was recognized a couple of years ago. Um, and um, it was recognized in large part due to this graphic which I redrew because it presented such a lovely depiction of the ecological uh, interrelations of this little, uh, this little landscape. So basically what you have here is um, 
of a mosaic forest, uh, a coppiced forest, which I'll describe in just a minute, um, that, um, it, that lines basically the tops, the hilltops of this, uh, of this coastal mountain range. Along the mid slopes, you tend to have um, plum orchards, uh, and most of the time, some places you have uh, different kinds of citrus uh, production, but plum is really the one that was recognized here. In the, at the edge of the forest, you have uh, people keeping bees, that little bee house, which use this mosaic forest, this forest in multiple stages of succession as habitat um, for uh, about 60 to 70% of their lives. They spend most of the time living in the forest, except for in the early spring when the plum blossoms in these brilliant pinks and reds and um, the bees feast on the nectar of the, of the orchards, provide obviously a very important service. In fact, it's, it's totally dependent. So the plum orchard completely depends upon the bees, the bees depend upon the forest. These um, soils, as we'll see in just a second, are extremely rocky, what they call rudacious soils, and they are just not very hospitable. They're essentially kind of like a, a, a compressed mud, and they're, they're just like a stony rock uh, uh, pebbly, 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 pebbly mud, I don't know how to say exactly. Anyway, nasty stuff is if you're a farmer. There's nothing really that you could grow there except for um, things which have very deep root systems. The landscapes are very steep and prone to landslide. This area of Wakayama is, um, experiences every year the brunt of the typhoon season which comes up. They have some of the highest single day rainfalls in Japan, and Japan is a country which, despite its small size, about the size of California, I believe, receives twice as much rain, rainfall as the entire United States. So this place really seems extreme weather. And these people have maintained, essentially what they're doing here is growing root systems to hold things in place. And in doing so, they um, uh, uh, provide uh, essentially a lot of downstream benefit as the water that collects instead of uh, running off too rapidly, kind of filters through this soil, which has been nicely uh, broken up. And um, at the proper kind of contour, they will build these um, uh, little um, uh, ponds. Uh, they will kind of dig out these little ponds. The water running downhill, groundwater will pool in that, will warm slightly, and then run into the um, rice and other vegetable gardens that kind of line the the lower slopes of, the, of these thin valleys, and then finally um, is used as irrigation for the main uh, rice and vegetable crop, which is down slope. But the plum, in terms of the financial side of things, it's really the main cash crop. So here, let's take a little picture. Here we're in a, in a, in a plot, a uh, coppiced plot, which has been um, trimmed about uh, two weeks, or about 10 days, or something like that, um, previous. You can see that um, you've got these kind of stringy uh, oak. This is the main species that these charcoal uh, makers, colliers, are interested in. And they've trimmed and cleared everything. And you, all of this brown stuff is essentially um, whatever has been removed from this field. It's, you can't see it really from this um, angle, but this is a very steep uh, um, uh, landscape. This is Masaki Hara. He's uh, the, the collier with whom I spent some time. He's really considered to be the best. Uh, he's really considered to be the best. And the best um, is measured by, um, in part by his ability to um, fire his kiln with the most different kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, species of tree. So the idea that he can produce what's considered to be the best quality charcoal in the world, um, no matter what variety it comes from. More varieties can put in, go to his kiln than anybody else's. And um, he's a, basically, he's a, technically he's a second generation, although I think that they're, they go back further. He did, he did all of this work basically by himself. Here you can see, uh, get an idea of the surrounding forest. Um, this is something which has been in regrowth for probably, I don't know, eight or 10 years. And um, this is a, a road cut here, but you can get a sense of how dense the forest would be otherwise. Just a sense of how uh, steep it is, if you can, if you can, if that gives any, uh-oh, uh-oh. Um, 
if that gives any uh, uh, sense. Do you see these oak trees here? A good look at the kind of the soil. Uh, and this is really what you're dealing with there. It's just, there's just not much uh, to go on. So um, it's really ready to kind of flow whenever it's exposed like this. So um, yeah, so here you see um, what, you, what you'll get there are these coppicing is a practice by which people repeatedly harvest from the same root base. And um, that's done uh, around the world uh, in, for firewood, for charcoal usually. And usually, at least in Europe, you find these trees which are coppice at about kind of human height. And you'll see these trees which have this enormous girth and then this big kind of bulbous top and then these weird little kind of stemmy like trees coming out of the top. And those can be, live to be centuries uh, old and even uh, some of them apparently in Italy can be almost a thousand years old. But trees like this will basically grow indefinitely as long as they're uh, harvested, apparently. So um, here's a look at the, at the oak, um, the density of this wood, which is really what's responsible for the special quality of the charcoal. Here's the kiln, Haras uh, kiln. It's really kind of an evocative place. I love to go there. Um, here we are looking into the kiln and just about um, at the point of, uh, of removal of the, of the, uh, of the lengths of, of charcoal. And there you can see what happens there. Get raked to the side here and then covered with this ash. The technique is, is, is particular to this place and um, I won't go into it in any real detail, but here you see this stuff. It's just like, it's, this is 90 to 95% pure carbon. So when the kiln is smoking, you're not losing carbon to the air. At first I was like, oh my God, what is this place? It's, you know, these, they're smoking up the whole place. But actually what they're, what, they're, what they're releasing are essentially the gases that represent the living matter of the tree and they're densifying the carbon structure of the thing so that what comes up here is this really kind of magical uh, material which has lots of interesting uh, properties. Uh, it's not like anything else you've ever really seen, I don't think. Really kind of uh, interesting stuff. And this is what it will look like on a kind of a, a cold winter's day um, with the smoke coming through under the, uh, the light coming through the canopy. So that, um, Mm, that's not. To, I was going to show you that first that first graph, if you can keep that in mind, of the ecological relationships. Um, that's the classic way in which this place is represented, as essentially a series, a sequence, an ecological sequence, and that's a really nice way of describing what's going on there. Um, and it helped, I think, this place to get designated as a GS zone, and yet it seemed to me um, totally insufficient as a description of the. Of the, of the practices that actually create the place. And so if we think instead of these zones, these different zones, here I have forest, bees, and orchard called out as essentially separate but mutually dependent knowledge domains, then we can think perhaps a little bit more creatively about what are the relationships that actually create this landscape. So you've got what I've kind of describing here is these vertical, which are the ecological kind of cause and effect, this kind of cascade of, of value. Each of these products, this charcoal is very high value. In fact, it's all bought up. You can't really get it unless you, you go there, you can find a few pieces, but basically the whole, the, every kiln, and you can get one, uh, every month you can get about three loads of, uh, of charcoal. They're bought up entirely and sold. It's very high value stuff, which I'll describe in just a minute. Um, and then plums too are big, big cash crop. So you've got kind of high value products coming out of the landscape and that's the kind of uh, vertical uh, ecological. But if we think perhaps on this kind of horizontal, you really have to look at what happens in the forest and the kiln and the food. And here when you look, it's very interesting because the metrics slip out you're no longer got ecological measurements. The measurements at which, by which you figure out what is happening, by which people are measuring, uh, or, or uh, uh, yeah, measuring their activities, become very uh, 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 flighty. And they end up showing up in things like the smoke, in things like the color and the taste and the smell of this wood vinegar, which is distilled in the charcoal making process. In, uh, 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 in, finally, in the taste of food, which is grilled with these uh, charcoal. 
the carbon charcoal burns, according to the chefs, um, the best. It puts out the best heat. It puts out the most even, the most steady, the most kind of uh, heat-like heat that you want. It's not a scorching heat. It's a dense, uh, rich heat that cooks food in the best way possible. So the main demand for this charcoal is in the very, very high-end restaurants that specialize in grilling of eel and uh, vegetables in Kyoto and Tokyo, in which the, basically the foods are cooked with almost no adornment, salt and perhaps a little bit of uh, the light sauces. But really the idea is that you're presenting to people food in its best, in its absolutely best cooked form, and that is through this uh, charcoal. So finally, the quality of this charcoal is being judged by chefs and by people who are eating the food way out in the city, a, distant, uh, a distance away. And Hara, when you start to talk to him about what it is that he's doing, he's constantly watching for these signals, the color of the smoke, the smell of the smoke, the color and the taste of this. And he's thinking about how he's going to get this and how this is going to translate into this. And he's even doing that when he is measuring his activities at the side of the field, of the, at, the, at the point of coppicing. Because the coppicing regime that he does happens over about a 15 year uh, 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 cycle. So he coppices uh, his, his oak, he takes it, he fires it. He returns in about 15 years to the same plot and can reharvest. But of course, no one is telling him that you know, 15 years, now's the right time. 12 years, he has, to, he has to understand that. He has to read, he has to have a sense of how what he believes is, in the kind of Descolans sense, the agencies of nature, of how they're being gathered together on the hillside and being essentially captured by those trees and how he, with that knowledge, will fire them. So firing takes about eight to 10 to 12 days all again based upon his uh, assessment of what's happening in the kiln. So he's measuring this uh, back and forth. I see my time is up. So in order to describe, rather than that ecological relationship, um, uh, that kind of typical ecological uh, uh, model, um, this uh, scientific illustrator and I, who went to the field together a few times, um, talked about how else we could represent it. And this was kind of our first iteration. And I like it, it's, it's, it's not so bad, but uh, yeah, it's the first one. So there, what we have tried to do is to show that um, essentially the, 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 that in the activity with, this, with the land manager at the center, with the actor at the center, he is working across all of these different fields in which essentially watching how the value, how the nature, how the, how, the, how the energies that he's interested in, the qualities that he's interested in, are captured or are present at mountain in general, at a tree at the, when he's harvesting, in terms of the root system that he's really watching over the long term, how that has to do with the quality of the timbers that he's finally harvesting, of how they must be mixed in the kiln in order to fire uh, properly, how the kiln can be managed by these signals in th the, 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 the color, the vinegar, the color, the smell, the smoke, and finally how the proof of this charcoal is present in the cooking of the food up in the top. And so if we look at that uh, landscape again, and here I'm really going to, this will be my last slide. Um, if we look at this, we can, we can begin to see that, that what Hara is doing is working across different, it's combining different kinds of knowledge that the charcoal knowledge or the charcoal forest is dependent upon not only his own ecological knowledge of forest, of topography, of all the kind of typical ec uh, ecological relationships that he sees there. And we're also talking about um, combinations of species. And that I saw you have Anna Singh coming soon, and she's been talking so brilliantly about the synergies, the symbiosis between different species. And I think that this is, this is exactly the type of uh, context that she uh, also is, is talking about in terms of the ecological side. There's all this, what we can call technical knowledge in terms of the tools, the techniques uh, that are being used at the point of, of harvest and uh, firing. And then finally, there's a lot of food 
knowledge. And that's a really important part that normally doesn't get included in terms of as a driving factor in any kind of ecological description of the landscape. But it's totally essential in terms of how people recognize the flavors, the proper flavors. And that much, it seems to me, of what people are doing when they're discriminating between flavors, at least in uh, deep enriched food cultures, is environmental. It has to do with the conditions of growth and the qualities of plants. And I will just say that if we were to look at these different domains, you could see, I think, similar types of knowledge at all of them overlapping in uh, interesting ways, which I will not, uh, which I have not really uh, investigated yet. And that as a whole, in a sense, if you're really interested in that ecological cascade, it's this kind of, it's this overlapping within and between these different features that ends up giving this whole thing uh, its value. And this is essentially my proposal in this, in this paper, that the forms of environmental knowledge are all around, but they're hidden from sight oftentimes, that they show up oftentimes in these very fascinating ways in terms of tastes and smells and even things like color uh, uh, and other features, which people within can read as signals of uh, uh, essentially affirming their sense of what is present and not present in the world around them. So thank you very much. Hey, okay. some, some okay. citations. Much, My Anna. pleasure. I realize it's one. Both of you who need to go through the next class or whatever, um, please do so. But that was such a fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you. I'm sure there are several people who want to say. Please. So, Mary, you're talking about the charcoal and who's, who's purchasing the charcoal and what's it being used for? I mean, what's the whole. Because that's kind of the basis, the economic basis of that. Can you just elaborate on that just very shortly? Because I'm fascinated about that. Yeah, the charcoal um, is sold to, a, a, there's a local uh, kind of collective that buys all the charcoal from these different charcoal makers. There are about 30 of these guys, um, uh, all men as far as I know. Um, and then there's a training center. Um, and then these guys, people, these individuals will also take apprentices, so there are people yeah. coming. But basically, the charcoal is sold to um, the restaurateurs. Okay. They're the major market for this. Okay. There's a small bit of, um, of, of kind of side market, but the, really the best quality um, goes to the restaurants. Okay. Yeah, okay. that's the main demand. Then you can see, if you look up uh, Bin Chotan, which is the kind of generic name for this stuff, you can find it. People are using it in water filters. They're using it here and there. And that um, is similar. Slightly different, but but pretty pretty close, yeah. And that that's being used, and I think that there are probably a bunch of other kind of uh, industrial uses yeah. for this stuff yeah. too. Great. Yeah. Well, a lot. Sure, Enjoy. my pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Related to that, uh, mm -hmm. the use of charcoal that you showed us how that is highly valued by these expensive restaurants, and I have to say, Dario is one of the two people who can make a reservation at Japanese for the next day to perform. I want to make a reservation tomorrow. He's the only one who was able to do it, apart from Ryuichi Sakamoto, uh, who is a well-known musician in New York. So uh, Daniel is very well connected with uh, uh, fancy restaurants. <laughs> but uh, what I'm curious is that um, I think what you presented is great. That um, makes me realize, OK, I'm trying to get rid of all the categories, but then I'm still thinking in a very categorical manner. I was wondering, the last slide seems like after I've gone all through, um, I think I have two questions. The mm. first question is that it seems still like getting back to ecological, technical, and cool yeah. categories yeah. in this slide. Yeah. So the reason why you show that slide after uh, I'm going through um, showing the holistic dimension, that's question number one. Question number two is that that kind of uh, whatever we call traditional ecological um, environmental knowledge or practice um, that uh, in terms of the commoners perspective, I know that it's still valued for the high priced restaurants and the high end of the um, <coughs> circulation and consumption. What's the relevance for the commoners' lifeways, especially those living in rural parts of 
Um, what's the relevance of the of the charcoal in particular? No, uh, the um, importance of this holistic view to think about ah, yeah. the life ways. So yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, so the first question is why divide into this um, into these uh, terms? You know, um, because I was just trying to figure out how to talk about these different ideas. You know, I was trying to th I was trying to think about the kinds of knowledge. I, I mean, once you get outside of of kind of our typical epistemological frame, you're left with very little to work with. I mean, this is a problem. You know, you really can't see another epistemology as equal, I think. You always are judging it through, these, uh, through this, this, this lens in which we have. This is just the, the way that we think. And so, um, but that's a, that's a big problem um, because it doesn't get at, as I was trying to say here, the, 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 the personal uh, or the cultural logic behind the creation of things which are then described in terms of this other logic. So the TEK thing is really guilty of you know, taking a specific crop, for example, charcoal or the, or the oak trees that are used there and saying, you know, you've got uh, all these medicinal values. The local people say you've got medicinal values there, so you extract the whatever it is and you try to figure out you know, what is the property which gives the medicinal thing. Mm -hmm. And the, although you may indeed be able to isolate that property, what you're missing is the contextual, all of the logic, all of the knowledge, which, was, which, was, which is behind essentially the creation and the recognition of that, that fact okay. that we treat as fact. So this was just my attempt in one way to, um, to, to divide, um, to try to talk about the different, the different kinds of knowledge which might be uh, at work. And in the, frankly, in the middle, um, I thought because ecological is so, uh, already we, are, we recognize um, ecological knowledge so, so easily, although people like Anand Singh make that much more uh, uh, confused. Um, about the, the cause and effect and, the, and essentially the model that we use to understand ecological relationships. And food knowledge is also kind of very, these days lots of people are talking about food knowledge. But then the technical knowledge too um, is more akin, is more, uh, I think more in terms of the French um, material culture studies people who are much that Leroy Gouron, whose book is on there about gesture and body and how that ends up being a really important part of knowledge as well. And I just wanted to say that if that there is no one realm of knowledge that was inherently more important or superior to the other. And that's why I just grasped at these three categories. But then the second one, this really comes down to uh, the, what's the significance of this type of knowledge for local people? It's no, it's not my question. I see Sorry. the significance of that kind of knowledge in terms of applying it to understanding the everyday life as opposed to a fancy charcoal making, is my question. I know it's, I see this kind of practice as a whole among commoners in rural parts of Japan, yeah. but it's much more rather than to make fancy charcoal or something that yeah. is seen traditional. Yeah. Uh, so-called traditional ecological knowledge is not in fancy expensive charcoal, but more of everyday uh, life or preserving mountain veggies, yeah. which is not expensive. Yeah. And I think that's the part yeah. that uh, is really relevant um, in terms of what you're talking about. Yeah. But often the examples tend to come up with really fancy something yeah. that can be seen, yes. uh, that can be labeled um, sometimes um, mistakenly as a culturalist part of it. Right, yeah, I'm in danger of uh, being, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 there, there, yeah, there is, a, there is a question about, you know, isn't this a very extreme example? And it is on the one hand, but I think that it's not in the other in the sense that um, if you, um, if, I think that you can go to other places and find um, other products that would be, or other uh, uh, entities that would be just as rich with knowledge um, it's just that this was ha happened to be one which was relatively close to me that I could kind of, once I began to think about that, wow, this is a really nice example. But charcoal making in general is one of many kind of forest management strategies that's used across different areas of Japan. And um, they don't tend to produce this really, really high quality charcoal, as you say, but still do. And I, you know, think as that as, um, having also uh, the ability to have these kind of overlaps, it's just that they may not be as kind of commanding mm -hmm. 
those uh, uh, in the charcoal in those situations may not be as in a kind of have such a a, 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 a weight within the place the way that this one really does because really if you think about it they could bring in pollinators but the charcoal forest that hybrid that mosaic forest it's the source of the pollination on which the rest of the community entirely depends and so these colliers are up there providing this incredible service to everybody else and totally out of view basically and people know that it's important to different degrees just the way that the bee people know that the forest is important and the Ume people know that the bees are important and that the forest is important, but they don't really specialize in that. So this is just an interesting way in which you could really look at the instrumental value, we can say, of one very specific practice across this whole landscape. So, yeah, thank you, please. You know, I've been having the same problem, too, of, of having to describe other people's knowledge outside of, you know, Western perspective. And one of the things that I thought in your speech is that there, there's a lingering sense of Hegel in there, and this whole idea of alienation. And how, I mean, would you speak to how people value this charcoal as high value? Is that really about price or about the value of the knowledge? Is it, it what, is there a key difference there? Does it get transformed, the value of knowledge gets transformed into an intrinsic price? Is there some kind of uh, alienating process there that happens? Yeah, well, yeah, I think yes and no. I mean, when we think about charcoal knowledge, who's the one? Uh, uh, sorry, hold on one second. Can I? She needs to leave, but she's wondering if you are around. <laughs> yeah, well, if, uh, just following this one. Yeah, yeah. I feel like you really need to. Oh, yeah, yes, great. I you and Meg, there's so much over I'm sorry to hide it. I'm not to dash it out, but yeah, we have. Sure, and that'd be great. Paper yeah. using most of those same references. Oh, really? From the paper that we just finished looking at landscape. Really? Oh, great. And I want to talk to you yeah. about the concept of landscape learning, uh, uh, which I don't know if you're familiar with, no. but it's been something I've really caught on to in archaeology. Yeah. I work in the prehistory. Great, yeah. Um, and yeah, it's fantastic talk. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A lot. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> we'll be around after, after this. I mean, I don't know what time you're here. I have a meeting. Oh, that's bad. But um, well, can I write to your email? I'll yeah. write to your email. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How about that? You're, you're around beyond today. Through uh, the weekend until Monday, I go back okay. to Japan. So maybe yeah. We can find yeah. Time. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah be great. That'd be great. More, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it'd be a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Very sorry about that. Um, you know, Sane talks about the story of, of mushrooms. Yeah. yeah. Um, from the point where it gets, where they get picked to where they're sold in restaurants. Yeah. It, it seems that you know people pick particular mushrooms in a certain way that they can be recognized by the picker. Yeah. And so, in order to alienate them, they're sorted over and over and over. Yeah. Again. Is that, does that happen? Here no, too? I think it's really different um, because here, okay, who values the charcoal knowledge? The collier, really, himself. They think this stuff is really deep. And if you talk to them about it, you try to say. In fact, there's a, in the paper there's a there's a there's a moment in which we ask this guy. So why is your charcoal so good? You know, what is it that you got that you're doing that's so different? And he kind of blanched for a minute. And then he went and he said, oh, it's the, it's the, it's the trees. And he was kind of very humble in that way. And I wasn't very satisfied with that in a way because I thought there was, there was, there was a bit, there was more. It was true. I was glad that he told me that much. But other than that, other than he who has spent now uh, apprentice under his father, said his father was a really difficult teacher, had to learn really, really well, tries to teach other people and can't get them to learn uh, how to do this stuff well. So he thinks this knowledge is really important and really deep, but not that many other people. The charcoal um, users out there in the restaurants, they appreciate the food and the flavor but I think that that's essentially a kind of a proxy in a sense. It's not really them talking about his knowledge. Even, the, I mean, they're not valuing his knowledge directly, personally. They don't think, oh gosh, well, aren't we lucky we had that collier out there? Not the way that people tend to do with a good farmer, at least in some places, you know. 
aren't we lucky that we have this really brilliant farmer? So the knowledge is actually undervalued in terms of the, the cultural significance of it. These guys are kind of out there like shadows in the, in the, in the, in the forest. Um, the only thing is that because that high end demand means that he can make good money, the collier. So he gets an affirmation as long as he's making that really good, as long as he's doing well by his forest management and his kiln management, he makes a really good living. So that's the signal that's interesting to him, aside from the fact that this stuff is really, uh, uh, that he, he really likes it. He likes doing his work. He's really fascinated by it. But he gets paid well. Do others that do that kind of practice make comparable living otherwise if they're not well-connected? Well, the, the apparently there are um, this certain number, about 30, who are doing um, essentially in, the, in this specific region, uh, this uh, this practice, and there is some of the same variety of oak trees growing in coastal hills in different prefectures, but I've never gone to see the charcoal there, and I don't really know about the market conditions. I have the feeling, because I, I think that um, much, when the, when, the, when the charcoal is bought up by this uh, kind of middleman, um, I think that oftentimes it could be mixed together so that there's a high standard, but that it's not, it's not, a, it's not like this guy's charcoal goes to this restaurant in, in, in particular. So I think that there's a gen, kind of generalization that happens there at that level, yeah, at the sorting. But the value that he gets is still really high. And among the colliers, he's known to be just, the, he's the one that gets, that writes the, when the, when the state, partly this is social network, but when the, the town wants to um, promote, for example, this, man, this technique of managing forest, he's the one who writes the guides. He's really, he's considered, even as one guy said, as a kind of local hero. So it's kind of unusual. I think it's not so, not so alienated. And I th that, then the, the thing of the valuation out there in this other world, to me, that, that, doesn't, that seems like um, a kind of that, that to me, I, I kind of like that part of the story in a way because we don't have to define this purely localized, you know, these absolutely, you know, kind of autonomous or, or autarchical zones, you know, in order to think about cultural, cultural survival or cultural persistence. You know, you don't have to do, not everything has to be right there on site. But if you can have, you know, you, can, you sell products out there to the market. Most farmers are trying to sell their stuff out there. You know, they want markets. So, you know, f f the idea that you have to kind of somehow have this at least intellectual prescription about what's a proper range for people to sell their territory, their, their products in, it becomes very difficult. And in, in this example, I like the way that you've got this very traditional knowledge, it seems, interfacing with this very, you know, it's Japan. It's the big economy. It's the modern country. It's all that. And so, you know, the farmers are trying to make a living within that economy. So let, you know, what are the relationships by which that may or may not be possible? That's kind of the way I approach it. All right, I talked a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.